Um, support. People ask all the time, please pray for us. And you can give uh, online at our website or to YouTube. Today's topic is a, well, we're going to talk, we're going to have a series on sanctification. A lot of saints want to know what it's like. Um, once you get saved, what's the next thing to do? And that is the issue of sanctification. So we're going to look at that. Um, before we get started, let's go to the Lord in prayer and give him thanks for this uh, evening. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we do thank you for this time tonight. We thank you that we can come together with those with like precious faith now twice a week again. Um, anytime we can get together as saints, especially getting into your word is a blessing and it's a comfort to see each other and to hear your, your holy word. Uh, your spirit in us and the word working through us uh, is, is how you have designed uh, the body of Christ to operate. So we thank you for this time. We pray for our brothers and sisters in Christ. A few of them are out because of sickness. It's that time of year, cold and flu. So we do think about them, and uh, we pray your marvelous grace and mercy be with them. Uh, Father, thank you for the blessing of technology that even those who uh, aren't with us today can still tune in live and even uh, once we record these a little bit later. So we thank you for that blessing so they can still hear your word and, 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 and feel like they with us in, they'll be with us in spirit. So Heavenly Father, as we look into your word today and the issue of sanctification, we pray that you give us insight, understanding, and wisdom. And most importantly, a, more, a, a greater appreciation of your son, the Lord Jesus Christ. It's in his wonderful name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. First Corinthians chapter number two is where, we, excuse me, first Corinthians chapter number one is where we're going to start this, this evening. First Corinthians chapter number one. Um, again, this is our first Wednesday in about a year. And uh, many of you all know over the years, I'm, I'm a morning bird, not a night owl. Sunday mornings, I'm ready to go. As you can see, Wednesday night, I'm more casual, just happy to be here, right, with the saints. So uh, to bear with me. First Corinthians chapter number one, if you read with me in verse number one, <clears throat> Paul says, Paul called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God and Sosthenes, our brother, unto the church of God, which is at Corinth, to them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints, with all that in every place call upon the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, both theirs and ours. Notice how Paul starts this book. We're going to deal with the issue of sanctification. We're going to have a series of it. And what we want to look at is what is sanctification? Uh, why does God want us sanctified? Um, we're going to look at the who, what, where, why, and how of sanctification. I'll talk more about that. After you get saved, after you trust the Lord Jesus Christ, the number one issue now with God is preparing you for the judgment seat of Christ. Uh, Brother King David will be listening to this sometime down the, the road. We play his music before we get started. And one of the things he talks about is preparing you for the judgment seat of Christ. The 10 minutes in the word uh, radio program, he sings, prepare you for the judgment seat of Christ. After you're saved, the next thing is the judgment seat of Christ. Now, like Dodie, we talk about this all the time, Dodie. We're waiting for the Lord to come because you've been walking with the Lord many years, as many years as anyone we know, okay? But God has given you all those years in order to be sanctified. That's why he left us here and to tell others about the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why he left, left us here. God could have took us all home to glory the moment we got saved and we would have been fine. But God wants to do something in and through us right now and that's that, what, what we're going to see is a process of sanctification, okay? Uh, by the way, I got a question about uh, could I do a study on the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ? And that's what I'm going to do next. After I finish the series on sanctification, I'm going to begin a series on the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, one, one event may uh, stop that, his actual coming. That's what I'm praying. But if the Lord does tarry, I want to do a study on the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ because I believe that time is near. It's, it's imminent, as they say. It's closer than, you know, I, I, used, I end uh, my Facebook Live study saying, remember, we're one day closer to the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, I'm going to do a series on the return or the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, as the Apostle Paul says, coming to receive the body of Christ. Um, so what is sanctification? To, uh, the word sanctification means simply be, means being set apart. Not necessarily has to be set apart unto God, okay? It just means to be set apart. Now, there's another Bible word in particular that means to be set apart unto God, and that word is holy. 
When the Bible wants you to know that somebody or something is set apart unto God, it uses the word holy. Uh, in 1 Corinthians 7, remember, we'll look at this later or sometime during our series. It says the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife and the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband. That's an issue where sanctification is used, but it has nothing to do with holiness. Uh, if you're an unbeliever, you, you're not holy. But you are set apart to your spouse. So if you're an unbelieving husband and, and she's pleased to dwell and, and, and you guys can make it work and he's, he's, he's not there spiritually, he still is useful for the marriage and vice versa. But then later, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 7, elsewhere your children unclean, but now are they holy? That word holy means those children belong to the Lord. So if at least one of the parents is a believer at the rapture, that child doesn't stay back with the, with the unbelieving parent. It goes wholly unto the Lord. It goes with the, with the believing parent. That's the importance of having at least one parent as a believer. Your child won't get left behind, okay, like the unbelievers. Look at verse 1. So, so sanctification means to be set apart. Look at verse 1, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 1. Paul called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God. I've been doing my radio series for five weeks now. I'm, I'm still on the first verse of Romans. It has to do with Paul called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel of God. Because that's what you need to know. Paul is your apostle. Look at verse 1. He's called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ, and it's through the will of God. Other passages, he says, by the will of God. It was God Almighty who chose the apostle Paul. It was the Lord Jesus Christ who came down and saved the Apostle Paul. But it was God the Father who chose Paul to be our apostle. Here in verse 1 of uh, 1 Corinthians 1, he says, And Sosthenes, our brother. Remember what we saw in our study um, when we were going through the book of Acts for our 2 Corinthians study? Sosthenes was beaten down in the book of Acts. He was the chief ruler of a synagogue. Now in Acts, you don't see Sosthenes getting saved. But after they beat him down at that judgment seat, Paul was there, and obviously the Apostle Paul stepped in and comforted him. I even said in the study, uh, Ryan will post it soon, I even said in that study, I speculate that as they beat him down, Sosthenes, the, the chief ruler of the synagogue, Paul would have healed him. And Paul would have said, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, rise up, you're healed. And that would have made that Jewish man, Sosthenes, trust Jesus Christ as his Savior. And now he is a brother. The word brother in scripture means one born for adversity. A brother is born for adversity. Now notice in verse 2, look at 1 Corinthians 1 verse 2, unto the church of God excuse me, the church of God which is at Corinth. And if you know anything about the Corinthians, we're studying 2 Corinthians and we're going through it with our map our map of Paul's, epistle, uh, Paul's apostolic journeys. Corinth was a place right there in southern Greece. It was a coastal city very rich very wise in human viewpoint and so forth. But it was the carnal Corinthians. They're known for their carnality, being babes in Christ. Well, notice what he says about these babes in Christ. Do you know two churches are known for the extremes of the flesh? You have the carnal Corinthians, or what we call uh, the carnal Corinthians, the, that, the Corinthianism. And then you have the religious or legalistic Galatians, right? They're known for that. Notice what he says in verse 2, unto the church of God, which is at Corinth. Now, Notice how Paul describes them in this. This is actually his second epistle to them. He wrote, a, he wrote an original epistle that wasn't scripture. You can, you can see that in 1 Corinthians 5. Okay? But here he says, he says, I wrote to you an epistle not to company with fornicators. Well, he obviously wrote an epistle before this, but it's not scripture. But here in the 1 Corinthians scripture, notice what he says. Verse 2, unto the church of God, which is at Corinth, to them that are sanctified in who? Christ Jesus. Now, when the Apostle Paul uses Christ first, it says Christ Jesus, the focus is not his earthly ministry or anything like that or his person. It's him as the suffering Savior. The reason why they are sanctified is because of what Jesus Christ accomplished at Calvary. And what we're going to see is, and I'm not going to write it on the board because we kind of turn backwards, but there's two things when it comes to sanctification being set apart. One is positional sanctification. Positional. The, the second one is practical sanctification. One is position, one is practice. Now notice, you see that in this one verse. Notice this in verse 2. Unto the church of God which is at Corinth, 
And even though they were babes in Christ and, and hardly even received the mystery of Christ from Paul, they were receiving man's wisdom. Notice what Paul says, verse 2, unto the church of God, which is at Corinth, to them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus. Notice they're in Christ. And when you're in Christ, when you're saved, you're in Christ and positionally you are set apart. You set apart unto God. Notice that to them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus. But look at the second part of that. He says, call to be what? Saint. He's saying, wait a minute. You are set apart. You're and then he says, now you're called to be set apart. You are positionally saints. Now be saints in your practice. You see that? Called to be that. Now the Corinthians, like us all, had a long way to go. But notice, Paul says, you are sanctified. Now walk like it. That's God. Here's your position in Christ. Now walk in that position. Okay? One is your position. One is your practice. One is your, uh, your, 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 um, this is, this is, this is who you are in Christ. Now God wants to Christ to be it formed in you. Okay. Now watch this. Look at the rest of that verse. So they are sanctified positionally. They're called to be saints practically. Be who, that's your calling. Now watch this. With all that in every place call upon the name of Jesus. Now notice he calls him Jesus Christ here. The first part of the verse, he calls him Christ Jesus because the focus is on the body of Christ. This part is upon the name of Jesus Christ our Lord. What's the focus here? His personhood. And who is, who is this Jesus Christ our Lord? Look at the end of verse 2. Both theirs and ours. Well, why is Paul going their, their Lord and our Lord? Because there are some little flock members, some believing remnant Jewish people who are there at Corinth. Think about it. Corinth was a place where both Jew and Gentile um, congregated. And there were other saints who were part of that old Jewish program who were around them. And Paul says, wherever I go, if I see members of the little flock, they give their, their greetings. That's why he says, with all, in the verse 2, with all that in every place, everywhere Paul went, there was little flock members. Call upon the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, both theirs and ours. This was a unique time in history where you had two select groups, different groups, who were both the people of God. Now, eventually, the little flock died off. And from then, God's just, the people are just being part of the body of Christ. But there was a time, from the time Paul got saved to the time the little flock died off, that God had two groups of people. He wasn't working the kingdom program, but members of the little flock helped the Apostle Paul. I'll give you a couple examples. How about Silas? Paul and Silas. Silas was a member of the little flock. And the most famous one is Barnabas. Barnabas was a member of the little flock. Okay, you see him back in Acts 4. Now, I want you to see that there's a positional sanctification, a positional in Christ. I'll show you a couple more. Look at verse 30 of chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 30. 1 Corinthians 1 verse 30. Paul says, by the way, here's the, here's the confusion that if you don't understand these things, you can get confused. Uh, and back in 2013, when, when we were talking about the issue of what, it be, what the difference between being an heir of God and joining heir with Christ. And, and people, when we were talking about, hey, that you have to understand justification versus sanctification, position versus practice. And people were confused, even amongst this position. They said, well, aren't we all sanctified? And, and somebody brought up this verse right here. But, but that person who brought it up wasn't cognizant that even when it comes to the word justification and sanctification, Justification, there's positional justification, and there's practical justification or vindication. Sanctification, there's positional and practice. So a better thing, even beyond justification and sanctification, it's position and practice. Because watch this. This verse was brought up. Verse 30, 1 Corinthians 1, verse 30. But of him, speaking of Jesus Christ, uh, uh, the Father, excuse me. But of him are ye in Christ Jesus. Again, when Paul used that issue of Christ Jesus, that focuses on his suffering and glory for the body of Christ, okay? But of him, God the Father, are ye in Christ Jesus? Now notice, he tells you you're in Christ Jesus. When you hear in Christ Jesus, you need to think position, 
That's my position. I'm in Christ Jesus. Who of God is made unto us. The focus is here is who are you in Jesus Christ? Christ Jesus. Who of God is made unto us what? Wisdom. Who's our wisdom? The Lord Jesus Christ. And righteousness. In 1 Corinthians 5, Paul's going to say, put away that wicked person. And the wicked person wasn't a lost man. The wicked person was a brother in the Lord. In 2 Corinthians 2, we're going to see that. They put him out and they brought him back in. He called him wicked. That man was still righteous positionally, though, because he was saved. He was in Christ. He was wicked in his practice, but he was righteous in his standing. Look at that. Because of Jesus Christ, verse 30. But of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God has made unto us wisdom and what? Righteousness ah, and sanctification and redemption. We have all these blessings in Christ. That's positional. We're set apart from the world to God just because we're saved. You know, I tell people all the time, God only sees two types of people in the world lost and saved. He sees people either in Adam or in Christ. There's no other way about it. God doesn't see that person as a... I tell my wife this almost every day. When you get into identity politics, when, anything is, when your identity is anything other than who you are in Christ, it's a mess. Whether you're about race, uh, you know, what they call race or, or, or the, the um, ethnics, white versus black versus Hispanic versus this, that groups, Republican, Democrat, all that stupid stuff. When you start putting yourself in a box that doesn't say in Christ, you're going to run into troubles. God doesn't see Jew and Gentile today. He doesn't even see nations particularly. He sees the Gentile. He just sees everybody as Gentiles who are in Adam or in Christ. God sees in Adam, say, uh, lost, in Christ saved. That's it. And that's how we ought to see people. We have every color, uh, uh, ethnic uh, group in, in, in this little assembly. Blacks, white, Hispanics, we got it all. Asians, when they're able to come, we got it all. But you know what? We don't see each other like that. We recognize the differences in a different way we come up. You know, I'm from the hood. Other people could be from the suburb. But the point is, when we're in Christ, that's where our identification is. I tell Krista all the time, all I see myself is in Christ. I recognize I'm a black man from the south side of Chicago. I know what's going on in the hood. I know. I, I lived it. But I, I put that aside when it comes to who I am in Christ. Because if you don't, you're going to be held down, held back. And that's what's going on. Notice what it says here, verse 30. But of him, he's the focus, the father. Are ye in Christ Jesus and God the Son, who of God is made unto us? He's our wisdom. Chris and I right now are dealing with a brother, well, a brother back in Minnesota, and he's starting to fall into human wisdom, human viewpoint, philosophy. And I knew he was prone to this when I knew him. I, I was trying to mentor him years ago. And his mind is starting to go into the human wisdom. And I want him to call me. I say, I want to tell the brother, listen, your wisdom shouldn't be what, what all this stuff, even your experience. It should be what is the word of God, the wisdom of God. Righteousness. We're going to see later that Israel tries to, to go about establishing their own righteousness. People do that today, religious people, legalism, sanctification. They're going to try to do it in their own strength. And I'm going to show you sanctification is a process, a long process. God uses the word long suffering. Remember, we were talking about the Sunday Dobby, where people say this nonsense in religion. You may be the only Jesus that that person ever sees in their life. That's stupid. Paul says, one plants, one waters, God gives the increase. Religion puts that on you so they, they, they want to force you, compel you to, get, to be a, a soul winner or to give your testimony. Not that we shouldn't tell people about Christ. But don't do it grudgingly. Don't do it out of religious bondage and pressure. No. The Lord Jesus Christ has many ways to communicate his word to others. You could be a part of it or you don't have to be a part of it. 
okay? Don't let him put that on you. It's his righteousness, his sanctification. It's a process and redemption. He's our redeemer. He's, he, he redeemed us from the very power of sin, excuse me, uh, penalty of sin, right? We won't go to hell. He redeems us through the process of sanctification from the very power of sin and confusion of the devil. And then one day, you know, we're not looking to die, as Paul says, to be naked, 2 Corinthians 5, without our body to die. We're looking for the rapture where we get our glorious bodies. There's our redemption from the very presence of sin. Okay? One more about this issue of sanctification. These are positional sanctification. By the way, interesting enough, the ones that I found on positional sanctification are all in 1 Corinthians. It's like God is giving a witness says, you know, they're, they're acting like heathen. You know they're carnal, but they're still set apart to me. Why? Because they're in Christ. Let's look at it. Look at uh, chapter 6. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 6. So when it comes to sanctification being set apart, there's positional, and then there's practical. We're going to look at the practical in a moment. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 11. Start at uh, verse 9. 1 Corinthians 6, verse 9. Know ye not that the unrighteous, now look at that, the unrighteous. Paul just told us Jesus Christ is our righteousness, right? We're in him. So what about these lost people? Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? He says those heathen aren't going to get God's kingdom. Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor adulterers, nor uh, idolaters, or, nor adulterers, adulterers, nor infeminate, nor abusers of themselves of mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall in inherit the kingdom of God. He says none of those people who live that lifestyle out there will inherit the kingdom of God. Look at the next verse. By the way, there, these are the Corinthians, and such were some of you. But ye are washed. But wait a minute, they were still babies, but they're washed. They're in Christ. But ye are what? Sanctified. They're set apart from the world in God's eyes. See, this is from God's viewpoint. If you want to understand what the word position means, it's how God sees you. How God sees you. We all still sin against God every day. I realize today, I go, every believer still has a, a, some rebellion against God in him, including me. We all do. I deal with saints all the time, every day. God knows that. That's why he had to put us in Christ. Notice this. Look at verse number 11. And such were some of you, but ye are washed, but ye are sanctified, but ye are justified. Notice that. That's not even positional justification. That, when I was talking about practical justification, that's part of it too, positional and practical. But ye are justified, this is the one position, in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. He set us apart. He declared us righteous. Paul goes on to say in verse 12, look at that. All things are lawful unto me. There are nothing unlawful, nothing against the law of God. But all things are not expedient. But you know what? They're not necessary, beneficial, or profitable. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. In another passage, he says, but all things edify not. I just want you to see, it's interesting. I found it interesting that the ones about positional sanctification have to do with the carnal Corinthians. It's like he's saying, you're saved by grace and you'll never lose that salvation. Now, a couple other ones I'll show you. Uh, no, I, you know what? Let's, we're, we're, we're right there. Look at 1 Corinthians 7, verse 14. I, I quoted it earlier, but I want you to see it with your, with your eyeballs. That's good to see the word of God. Here's a, here's a sanctified that's not particularly un, as far as unto God. This is just set apart, husband and wife. Verse 14, 1 Corinthians 7, 14. For the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife. So if you're, if you're a sister in the Lord and your husband's lost, he's sanctified 
to your marriage. He has a purpose, a God-given purpose. He himself is lost, and if he, if he stays lost, he's going to hell. But the good news is, look at the rest of this passage. For the, verse 14, for the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband. If you're a brother in the Lord and your wife is lost, she still serves a purpose in the marriage if she's willing. In other words, she doesn't have to be saved in order for you to have a marriage that can operate if she's willing to be your wife. Now, you want her to share the word of God with you. Years ago, we were at a church picnic in, back in Illinois. This is before I even met Krista. This is years ago, maybe going on 20 years ago, first got in ministry. And uh, it was definitely the summer, because in Illinois, it's cold right now, right? We were talking with Craig and everybody on the East Coast, Midwest and East Coast, even down South, it's colder than usual. So it had to be the summer, we were outside. And we are at this picnic having food, and one brother was struggling, because he's, he, he's coming to no right division. He was trying to share with his wife. She, had no, she didn't want no parts of it. That's who I'm talking about. No, this is even before them, Mom. It's, it's, uh, I'll tell, I tell you later. He, I doubt if he's watching this in person. Anyway. Uh, no, not, 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 not Brother Rick. No, no. It was, at, it, was at his, it was at his picnic, but it was another guy. It was a younger guy. I'll tell you about it if you remember. I'll see if you remember. Anyway, he was saying that, because Brother Rick, he, he understood. He, you know, he's a pastor. Anyway, this brother, he's a young brother in the Lord, and he was saying, we were talking about how if you have a spouse who is a grace believer and you're a grace believer, it could be the highest halls of human happiness. That's how Brother Richard Jordan says it. And that's, he's right, highest halls of human happiness. In other words, if you, if you rank human happiness, there's nothing that, as far as human happiness better than having a spouse who's a grace believer, okay? Nothing higher. But the opposite is true, too, that if you're a grace believer and your spouse is lost or not, or, or rejects the grace message, you're religious, it could be the lowest hell. And that's what this one brother said. He's like, it's the lowest hell. And I felt, he was like, yeah, you're right, bro. But if your wife is willing to stay with you, um, or vice versa, yeah. There you go, right, Dodie? Vice versa. Because <laughs> you could be a woman and your husband is that way, right? You know, if they're willing to stay with you and they're willing if the only thing is they just reject the Lord, it's, that's not enough for getting out of the marriage. Now, if, 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 there might be other reasons, but he's saying there's, there's, a, there's a sanctified purpose for them. Look at verse 14. But the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife. The unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband. Else were your children unclean. Notice what marriage is designed to do to produce holy children. But what if one of the spouses is not saved? It doesn't matter to God. He says, but now are they, speaking of your children, holy. And that word holy is set apart unto God. People ask me all the time, if the rapture run, my husband is lost, I'm saved, or my wife is lost, I'm saved, we have little children. I don't want to be left behind in this world with my unbelieving spouse. I said, don't worry about it. They're, they're, they belong to the Lord. And if you're saved, they're going. If the rapture came at the time, uh, 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 that Timothy was there. Timothy's father was a heathen. Acts 16, his mother was a believer. Bam, here we go. Timothy was gone when he was a young boy. All right, look at verse number 15. But if the unbelieving depart, you know what Paul says? Let them depart, go. If they don't want to be there, let them go. And I love this because religion won't tell you this. And the Old Testament won't tell you. A brother or a sister is not under what? Bondage. That's the law, bondage in such cases. And when God does the judging, it's case by case. Like a good judge, case by case. A brother or sister is not under bondage in such cases. Why? But God has called us to peace. God wants the marriage, whether it's lost or saved, to have peace. Okay? Whether your spouse is lost or saved, to have peace. Okay? But I want you to see, that's one of sanctification that has nothing to do with only set apart unto God. So sanctification means to be set apart. Obviously, God wants to set apart unto him. Um, now, what's needed for sanctification? The how of sanctification. Before we look at the, practic uh, the process or the process of practical sanctification, because it is a process, 
Um, let me show you something. Go over to John 17, 17. And, and Brother Lyle, yes, go ahead. Mm -hmm. um, when the man and the woman leave, then are, are they, they're not under that protection of sanctification anymore, right? Uh, say, uh, say that again. Are they still under that protection of sanctification? Or uh, when they leave, that's, that's it. If they choose time. to leave, you're free. You're not under bondage in such cases. God says, in such cases, you got unbelieving depart, let them depart. Mm -hmm. if, in God's eyes, they, they chose to go, they that's their go. problem. Yep, it ain't, your, it ain't your problem. Yep. Look at John 17, 17. This is the real, true Lord's Prayer. You know, people call the Lord's Prayer that our Father prayer. That's really the disciples' prayer because they said, Lord, teach us to pray. The true Lord's Prayer is found here in John 17. And I'm not, I won't go through the whole thing. You can do that on your own. But I, I wanted you to see a verse that is succinct and profound. He's talking about his apostles and his, and his, and his uh, disciples. The Lord is. Notice what he says to the Father. He's praying to the Father. In fact, look at chapter 17, verse 1. John 17, verse 1. These words spake Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven. So he's about to pray. And said, Father, the hour is come. He's about to go to the cross soon. Glorify thy son, that thy son also may glorify thee. And the way God's going to glorify his son is his son's going to go and die on the cross. And the way the son's going to glorify the father is on the third day he's going to rise again to the glory of God. Now, in the midst of that, look at verse 17. I love this verse. John 17, 17. Sanctify them through thy what? Truth. Thy word is truth. So how is the Lord praying that God sanctifies his people? By thy truth. You need truth. He says to the woman in the well, chapters earlier, he says, God wishes for those to worship him in spirit and in truth. So just like Pilate says to Jesus later in this book, he says, what is truth? Jesus says, I am the truth. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Notice, thy word is truth. So when it comes to sanctification, what's going to set us apart? Set us apart? This series on sanctification. It's going to be through the word of truth, right? You and I can't be sanctified, practically speaking, if we don't have God's truth. And today, because you have to rightly divide, God's truth is found in Paul's 13 books, Romans through Philemon. Craig's been looking at it so much, it, they fell out of his Bible. He had to staple them back in. But that's a good sign, Craig, because when you got pages falling out and stuff, and tape everywhere and stuff. That's a good sign there, right? But it's through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Go over to 1 Thessalonians chapter number 2. Go over to 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. Look what Paul says. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. Good thing I remember all the verses by heart because a lot of my pages, little pieces fall off, and I don't know what happened to them. And it'll be ver parts of verses and stuff. About half the time I'm reading, I'm, I'm talking, I'm sharing them with you guys. I'm not even reading them. I'm, I'm, I'm reading them from the top of my head. So if I make a mistake, you know why. If I par start paraphrasing, so I better look at the verse. Uh, you got 1 first first Thessalonians chapter 2. Look at verse 13. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13. For this cause also thank we God. It was Paul, Silas, and Timotheus. Silas was a member of the little flock. For this cause also thank we God without ceasing. Because when you received the word of God, which you heard of us, ye received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth. Notice you see the word of God in truth in the same verse. The word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that what? Believe. Now, what I want you to see here, why would Paul say when you receive the word of God from us, you didn't receive it with the word of men? Didn't the Bereans in Acts 17, after Paul was at Thessalonica, the Bereans searched the scriptures to see where those things are so. But you know what Paul is talking about? There were things about the mystery that they couldn't go and look at the Old Testament about. They had to take Paul's word for it. And if you read this book, 
they, Paul proved that he was truly an apostle, not just by the signs and the wonders, by his conduct. Paul conducted himself like a saint, not like a heathen, and they trusted him. But notice that verse, verse 13, for this cause also thank we God without ceasing. Because when ye received the word of God, which you heard of us, ye received it not as the word of men. Think about that, guys. God uses man to relay truth. Whether it's men to prophesy truth, like the Old Testament prophets, whether it's men to write down his truth, like prophets and apostles and all that, whether it's men to communicate his truth through preaching and teaching, God uses men. You ever hear people say this stupid thing? Ah, the Bible is just a collection of, of, of stories written by man. Well, they're partly true. God chose to use man. But the Bible is not the word of men. Look at this. It's not the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of who? God. Second Timothy chapter three, Paul says all scripture, all scripture, the written word is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. Even though man is used as the, the vessel, it's God's word. Look at that verse at the end. You received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God. Now, what do we know about the word of God? Sanctify them by thy truth. Thy word is true. God's word has a power, doesn't it? You know what the power is? Look at this. Which effectually worketh. Does God's word work? Yes, effectually. That word effectually is more than just effective. I always remember what the brother said. It's beautiful. Um, when they try to tear old stadiums down, they want to implode the stadium. Not explode it, so it just go miles and miles and hurt people. But implode it, boom, boom, boom. Engineers kind of put dynamite in strategic places so that when they do, boom, energy. By the way, that word is energy. Effectually, is, is, is the, the Greek word is energy. So when that energy from that explosion, boom, instead of going 1,000 yards that way, they hit it just right so that sucker like collapsed on itself with very little, although the Georgia Dome, they had to implode it twice because some of the charges didn't go off. Effectual. Dynamite is effective. You can use dynamite to blow something up, or you can use it as, as an engineer and blow it up, but have it implode upon itself. You can, you can control it. God's word is both, by the way. God's word can blow the lost person up. A person who's hard-hearted, God's word can come and just destroy them. But if you're soft-hearted and you believe his word, notice how it works in you which effectually worketh also in you that believe. You say to God, all right, God, you're the, you're the wise architect here. Put your powerful word in me and just let it work effectually. I believe it, and it'll work perfectly in me. That's how sanctification works today. <clears throat> sanctification is a, a process. Now, remember I said, we looked in 1 Corinthians and all of those positional sanctifications verses, but that was only a few. Most of the references to sanctification in Paul's epistles are not positional sanctification, but practice. This much about it is position. That much is practice. I tell people, about 10% of Paul's epistles is reminding you how you got saved. Christ died for you. Christ shed his blood for you. The rest, the 90% of his epistles are telling you now what to do with that. What does that mean? A few verses on positional sanctification. Hey, you're in Christ. Now what to do with it? You're called to be a saint. Now, with the time we have left, we got 10 minutes. Sanctification, practical sanctification is a process. Here, here's, here's the definition of a process. It's a gradual proceeding or moving forward. Let me say that again. A process is a gradual proceeding or moving forward. It has changes in growth. It could take years. So check this out. Uh, Craig, Craig, I love Craig. Brother Craig, he, he's listened to our studies. And he's listening, listening. And he's, he's listened to studies from the time 
Jada Lynn was a baby, and now she's eight years old. Eight and a half, if you ask her. Okay. They count halves when they're in that age. We trying to take years off. She's trying to add years. Okay. <laughs> and I say stuff like that make Craig laugh. But since having Jada Lynn, it has increased my understanding of the word of God. I can see how God sees us. And whether progression, uh, whether uh, a process is a gradual moving forward linear or, you know, horizontally, or with, in case of Jada Lynn, it can also be changes in growth. So we've watched her. Krista and I will look at pictures. We'll look at videos. The greatest advice we got when, when she was young, somebody back in Minnesota said, take as many pictures and videos as you can. Pictures because you forget how they looked. Video so you can hear how they sound. Because we'll listen to videos, and her voice was so little and squeaky. We go, oh, man, she doesn't sound like that. Yep. So take pictures and video. But it, with that, you can see her progression and growth. That's what a process is. Whether the process is a moving forward gradual or, or growing gra up gradually, gradually. It says about the Lord Jesus that he grew in wisdom and stature. Okay, um, we got 10 minutes, or about eight minutes. Look at this. So practical sanctification. Let's see where I want to start. There's so many of these. Um, let's start in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. We're in 1 Thessalonians here. Go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Look at verse 1. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 1. Furthermore, then, we beseech you, brethren, and exhort you by the Lord Jesus Christ. The more you understand Paul's epistles, every, every bit of this, you can get something out of. Look at this here. Furthermore, so add to what he just wrote in, in the first two, three chapters. Furthermore, then we beseech you. You know what beseeching is? It's like to beg of you. Paul could command us, and he does. He could force you. He won't. He could, but he beseeches, he begs, because love beseeches. Furthermore, then, we beseech you, brethren. But just for those who need a look, you ever heard of the carrot and the stick? You know? You can give a, a you, can, you can lead a horse by putting a carrot there and just kind of walking back, and the, here come the horse. Or if the horse decides he he's not hungry, he don't take care of you kind of give him a little spanking on the back end. Look what he says. Very kindly, we beseech you, brethren. But then he says, and we exhort you. That's kind of, we're going to move you forward. How? By the Lord Jesus. Paul says, remember, the righteous judge is watching. That's motivation, isn't it? That as you have received of us, and we already saw that they received the word from him, that as you have received of us how ye ought to walk and to please God, so you would abound more and more. Why do we constantly have studies in God's word? Because God wants us to get to a certain point and continue on. Jada Lynn's eight years old. If the Lord tarries, if she stopped growing, that would be a problem. I expect her to at least grow as tall as maybe her mom, right? Maybe in between Chris and I because of genetics. But if she stops maturing in her mind, that would be a problem. She thinks like an eight-year-old. Huh? She never will. No. <laughs> She's going to continue, right? Because God wants her to abound more and more in her understanding. And that takes time, right? Would you ever, you wouldn't, you wouldn't, you shouldn't beat up an eight-year-old because they don't do things like an 18-year-old. They don't think like an 18-year-old. Now, when she's 18, her mother and I can say, you know better than this. You're 18. But we can't hold her to the same standard at 8 that we do 18. God doesn't do that either. Notice here. He says, you might abound more and more. Keep growing. Verse 2. For you know what commandments we gave you by the Lord Jesus. Paul keeps putting the Lord Jesus in there. By the way, he's the Lord Jesus. It, it, it irks me when I hear the religious guys talk about Jesus, Jesus. Jesus this, Jesus that. And I say, no, 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 he's the Lord Jesus. At least give him that part. He's the Lord Jesus Christ. Give him his due. But at least give him the Lord Jesus. The right, he's the righteous judge. Don't be so flippant. He's, not, he's more than just Jesus. He's the Lord Jesus. 
And Paul says, I'm going to command you by the Lord Jesus what to do. Verse 3, for this is the will of God, even your sanctification. God's will for the believer is our sanctification. And in this case, he says that you should abstain from fornication, both spiritual and physical, that, ye, that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and in honor. It's talking about our physical body, our earthen vessel. Verse 5, not in the lust of concupiscence, even as the Gentiles which know not God. Don't be like them. And just how you know how you, how you should deal with your brethren, that no man go beyond and defraud his brother in any matter. Now, this is the scariest part to me. Because that the Lord, the righteous judge, is the avenger. Captain America wasn't the first avenger. No, no, no. No, no, no. Jesus Christ, our Lord, is the, the avenger. For all, of all such as we have forewarned you and testified, for God hath not called us unto uncleanness, but unto holiness. The sanctification process is how God perfects holiness in the saints. It's by his word. It's by a fear and trembling of a reverence of the righteous judge. But can I say, as we got five minutes left, it's a process. Don't beat yourself up. But put effort into doing what we're doing now. Go back a couple of, uh, go back to chapter one. Look at First Thessalonians chapter one. You have to grow in God's word. We're going to look at a couple verses. Um, first, oh, yeah. First Thessalonians chapter one, verse three. Yeah. Remembering without ceasing your what? Your work of faith. That's why we meet here every Sunday and every other Wednesday, because we want to do the work of faith. Right. But not only that, look at this. And labor of love. By being here, we serve one another, don't we? And he says, by love, serve one another, Galatians 5. And patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. You know, my job and, and the job of saints is to keep reminding you, you know why we do this each, each time we come? It's because there's glory. There's reigning out there. There's a hope of glory. Don't give up. You were asking about a brother who, where is he? He did, he's too, he didn't understand the hope of glory, what we're doing here yet. He didn't understand why God is doing this. It was too much. His mind wasn't where, it's all right, it's a process. It will be here. But you have to understand why you meet here to build yourself up, but to edify others too, okay? Now let's end over in Romans 16. Let's end in Romans 16. Got two men in Romans 16. Romans 16. In two weeks, when we look at, we're gonna we're gonna probably do one one or two other sessions on this. Although sanctification is a process, and you mentioned it, Dodie, a long process. Dodie, you've been you've been in this process for over 50 plus years, right? More than that. Can't tell, you look young, see? Others, it's been just a few months. But either way, God wants you to get to an end point. He's a God of process, but he's a God of end results too. He's not like the politicians, right? They all, you go to Illinois, they all, I could drive, to, we could fly to Illinois and, and hit, the, hit the highway, and they got a, they got a building, pro, they got a uh, highway project. It's cold, it's the middle of winter. So maybe, they always got cones out there pretending like they got something going on, a highway project. That's how they take the tolls and stuff. You know you see guys out there, it'd be equipment out there and cones and stuff, <laughs> orange cones, and you say, where the people? And you can go, it's a sham. But they take your tolls. You can't go anywhere in Illinois highways without tolls, man. And the tolls are for the, you know, the roads. But you never see anybody working on the roads. <laughs> That's not God. It's just a continual pretending like they're working on the roads, taking your toll money, okay? 
This is God. Look at Romans 16, verse 25. Paul ends this book by giving praise to Almighty God. Romans 16, 25. Now to him that is of power. Now remember what we said, the difference of power and might. Yes, that's, that's from the resurrection power, right? Power is, so the strength is there, but might is, is put into action, okay? The almighty. He's not all talk, he's action. Politician, all talk, no action. God has power and he'll put it in might. He'll put it in, in you. But you need to be a part of this process. So he's got the power to do it. It becomes mighty working in you, we're going to see when you believe it. We're going to see that in Colossians next time. Verse 25, now to him that is a power to establish you. Next time we're going to see the difference between establish and establish. There's a difference. Most people don't even know there's a difference. Even those King James, um, um, what do they call them? They just, the publishers, the publishers. They think they're helping you out by changing words like establish to establish, right? They're messing you up by changing establish to establish. Next time, I'm going to show you, next Wednesday, the next Wednesday we meet on the 17th, I'm going to show you that there are verses where God, God's word uses both words in the, same, in the same verse. It'll be established and established in the same. So it's obviously different meanings for them. But what these publishers do, they say, we don't, we, oh, that's old English, established. Let's put an E right there. And I've seen King James, people have showed me their King James Bible where, the, where my word says established and theirs says established. And these publishers think they're helping you out, but they're not. They don't know anything. Leave the Bible the way it is. Stop messing with it. Okay? The word establish has to do with the end result. And establish is the process. One is the process, particularly from the, from, from the outside in. Someone is involved in establishing you. Establish is the end result where God is working from the inside out. Yeah. All right? Let's finish here. Now, of him that is a power to establish you, According to my gospel, on our radio program, I'm showing people, Paul uses that term, my gospel. Nobody else does. He uses it three times, the number of witness and resurrection. My gospel. But you need to hear preaching, too. God never intended saints not to have preaching, particularly live preaching and teaching. Now, we know because of unfaithfulness of ministers, not every saint can have a, a, a grace assembly where you can come here live preaching. And so God in his mercy, you know what he's done? He's put us in a time for such a time as this that we have the blessing of technology. I'm on Facebook Live and it, and it hasn't gone out yet, at least from my viewpoint. And people all around the world can listen in and then when I post this, they can watch it. We, we we're videotaping, putting it on YouTube. I read every Sunday how people enjoy the messages on YouTube and so forth. But really, you need to have preaching. Preaching is warning and teaching. You know, I was thinking about this as, as we end. Every saint has to be held accountable in Christ by other saints. If you're a sister in the Lord, who is the man holding you accountable in the Lord? If you're a brother in the Lord, who are the other brothers holding you accountable in the Lord? That, everybody has to answer that question. As a brother in the Lord, I'm held accountable by the saints here in NorCal Grace, the brothers, because they had to be able to say, Brother Ryan, you said this. Can you show me that? Hold you accountable. Preaching, warning, teaching. Because you need that. That's how God establishes a believer. Verse 25, now to him that is a power to establish you according to my gospel. That's that has to do with gospel of the grace of God. But it has to be preached. And the preaching of Jesus Christ. That's his gospel. Paul's got Right, the gospel of grace of God, Paul would call yes, Dodie. Yes. But then you have to have a regular basis, the preaching too, right? Notice here, and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery. Right. Which was kept secret. So what, what he's talking about here now, Dodie, is the dynamic of what we do here. You have to have regular preaching on a regular basis, you know what I mean? But now it's made manifest. And he talked about the scriptures of the prophets, that issue of, the, 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 the word of God, 
the entire word of God rightly divided. We talk about the scripture of the prophets in chapter 1 as well. And God's going to use all these things to establish you if you allow them. But part of that is what a local assembly is designed to give you that preaching. You know, the Lord is soon to come. And um, when we're done with this in the next two sessions, probably, so that's a month from now, I'm going to start on the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And that was going to be my most exciting thing. That's probably the thing I think about the most every day. I, pro I beg the Lord every day to come. Not just for me and my family. We, we all him. I know how other saints are suffering. I see we're in the end times of the dispensation of grace. I see the stage being set for the end times of prophecy. It's, 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 it's exciting, but it's also, come on, Lord, hasten. And Lord, haste the day where our faith to be sighted. But I can, if, if the Lord tears, I want, I want, I'm going to do that, the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, because I want to, that'll be awesome if that's the last thing I teach about before his return. I want to be I want to be dealing with that when he returns. Yes, I want to I want to get that in and, and then have him return. So Lord, if you can just do a brother a solid, we can do that, all right? No, I trust him. We trust him. You know, any every day when I bet I say, "Lord, please come." Then I, I end it like this. I say, "Lord, you're the you're the look let's end in verse 27. To God only wise. That's what Brother King David said. To God only wise. To God only wise be glory through Jesus Christ forever and ever, forever. Amen. The Lord is wise. So you know what I say? Lord, I want, we want you to come. But I know if you tarry because of your wisdom, that's the best thing for us. And the best thing that you're doing. So that's how you trust him. You give him your request. And I beg him each day to come. But then I say, but if you don't come and when I want you to come, I trust your timing. We, we should always do that, right? He's the only wise God. I'm not going to second guess his plan and purpose. Neither should any of us. All right, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for your great wisdom, your great mercy and grace. We thank you for this time to, tonight, Father. And what a refreshing thing. I'm glad we're doing this again uh, right now every couple of weeks on a Wednesday. Um, we're just thankful, Father, that we can even have saints come out on this evening. We got saints who will watch this, you know, wherever time zone in. And then when I post it, they'll get to hear your word about sanctification. The goal of this study, Father, is to get people to understand that there's a reason you left us back here in this world. You have a plan and purpose to glorify your son, the Lord Jesus, in this little time we have left. So, And also to give us a chance to build a reward, to build up our reward of the inheritance for serving the Lord Christ. So we thank you for that. But, Father, our hearts do yearn for you to come. Um, we want to be with you. We don't want to be in this Christ-rejecting, sin-cursed, hateful world. Too much of that crap out there. We want to be with you, Lord. But we do wait. We wait on your timing as you're the only wise God. Give us the patience and long-suffering with joyfulness that your word says we can have. We look for you, Father. We look for the return of your Son. But in the meantime, we thank you for this time together and the blessing of this midweek study, Father, to refresh our spirits. We thank you for this in Christ's name. Amen.